Alrighty. Hey guys, I uh, hope everyone's doing well. I wanted to um, uh, share with you a case and tell you a little bit about a travel I had to uh, Washington, D.C. just the last weekend. Uh, the case that I had uh, was from uh, just earlier today. And uh, yesterday I gave a talk on resorptive lesions uh, at our school and you know how to manage resorption and so on and it's interesting that the day after the lecture i had a patient that had again another i see these kinds of patients all the time but i thought it was an interesting case that was worth sharing and then i'll tell you a little bit about my last weekend's trip to washington dc and meeting up uh, with another endodontist there and talk about a little case over there at the very end but the case i was going to share with you is this one this is the case of a uh, 55 year old uh, oncologist a famous oncologist at mass general hospital who was referred to me for a uh, second opinion and seeing what happened to this tooth as you can see in december 18th of this year we're now in late january and uh, december 18th which is about a month ago he, ha he saw his uh, general dentist for a regular cleaning and he kind of explained that it was kind of a little bit of a rough cleaning according to him and uh, came back after the dis he had some discomfort afterwards and one given tooth on the lower right side as you can see as we're talking about tooth number 19 and then went back to his general dentist about a month ago, month after that, in January 19, just about less than 10 days from uh, today. And this is what had happened in about a month, actually in exactly a month and a day between the two visits. So as you can see, there is a loss of bone in the furcation area and that we also appears to be having some overlap of that radiolucency over the roots on this area. And uh, I took one look at it and it did not look good to me before, this is before the CT, just looking at it. And then clinically speaking, uh, the day which I saw him, which was just uh, earlier today, January 27th, uh, what he was having is he was having a little bit of a sinus tract uh, right in the furcation area, as you can see on the right side. And uh, in my radiograph from just uh, about a week or so ago, that he had taken, there was still a little bit more radiolucency going on. So he was having some drainage apparently. Uh, and I was at this point thinking, is this going to be resorption? If it is resorption, is it cervical root resorption? What kind of resorption is it? And what caused it? Now clearly, cervical root resorption in general does not proceed uh, or become as aggressive as this and expand so quickly. But uh, so I wanted to figure out what it is and we decided to take a to look and take a CT and find out is this tooth manageable or savable and you can see based on the CT he does not have any restorations other than the crown on the same tooth on the opposite side. He has generally very good oral hygiene as I said he's a, uh, he's a physician oncologist and uh, we look at the CT and you can see right here from the CT that we have some focal bone loss on the 3D image of the tooth and uh, the question now here is what is going on underneath there. And uh, so we take a quick look at the uh, uh, other sections here, and you can see just looking at the uh, sagittal section, we straighten this up that, wow, we have a serious resorptive defect going on on the side of the uh, mesial root. And the mesial root is now appears to be fairly damaged as a result of this. And as we go in and look at the uh, coronal section through the tooth, we can see that this resorption is coming in from right from the distal aspect of the mesial root and is kind of uh, causing a lot of problems. Here, looking at the sagittal, or rather looking at the axial section, we can see that there was a tiny bit of a radiolucency that appeared to be, when I looked at it clinically, a potential crack. And you can see that there is some calcification in the chamber of this tooth. Usually that's indicative of a chronic crack going on in the tooth in, in some people. And as the axial section shows, there is a lot of destruction here in the mid-root portion of the tooth, but this is the junction of the mid-root and the coronal one-third of the tooth. And at this point, looking at this tooth, it did not look like I could do a good job repairing it. And because of the already bone loss that he had in the frication area, I did not think this would be a good candidate for root canal therapy followed by surgical repair. Another reason for that is because root canal therapy in this distal aspect of this tooth would not be so easy since there is already so much resorption going on. The distal aspect of the mesial root would not be so easy because uh, there is obviously a large opening in there. So then other potential uh, 
ways that we could save this tooth. And obviously, as you can tell, this patient having had such good oral hygiene to now lose a tooth was fairly devastating to him. Uh, and the only other possible way would be to do maybe a root amputation for him. But again, because of the furcal bone loss that we can see in the upper right corner, the furcal bone loss is going to end up having difficulties with achieving proper attachment potentially and could become a serious problem. Now, one other possible way would be to do root canal therapy up to that segment and instead of doing a surgical uh, um, kind of a uh, root amp, to actually do what we call intentional reimplantation to remove the tooth externally and do a repair outside and then put the tooth back in. But since the roots are fairly uh, divergent in this case or not conical enough, this may not necessarily be a good um, or predictable option as not only the root may break during the extraction, but also that uh, it may not get reinserted back into the spot properly since uh, they, they do seem to have some undercuts. You can't have undercuts in these types of cases in which you decide to do intentional reimplantation to save the tooth. So therefore, my only option for him at this point was, again, to assessing the risk would be to uh, have the tooth removed and replaced with, uh, with an implant in this particular case. And uh, he was happy to know that at least he has an option, which is a good thing nowadays to have implants as a, as a potential option. But to just want to go back again over the diagnosis as to what type of resorption this is, this actually is an interesting case of inflam acute inflammatory root resorption. And this is not cervical root resorption. And what has happened, it's, now whether it was purely by coincidence or something triggered beyond the crack in the tooth, to cause acute necrosis in this tooth. And the acute necrosis cascaded down these roots and I did confirm that the tooth was uh, non-responsive to pulp vitality tests. And as a result of this necrosis, the same thing that happens in young teeth that get traumatized and they end up going through inflammatory root resorption. In this gentleman's case, unfortunately, he probably had some type of a lateral canal or accessory canal in the mid-root portion of the mesial root where the majority of the necrotic tissue was uh, escaping, and that became the root of the original resorption, and then it, it, it must have coincided somehow with this uh, with inflammatory root resorption kind of triggering in. As we know, resorption is usually a culmination of the loss of a protective layer of the tooth, usually pre-cementum on the external root resorption, and then followed by some form of inflammation. And I think this is basically what happened to him. And as a result, he is going to end up losing his tooth based on my recommendation. If you think that there was another way that this tooth could have been saved, I would love to hear your opinion in the comments below. Now, let me also tell you that last weekend, I had the chance to go uh, down, take the train actually of all things. I usually try to fly to kind of make things a little bit quicker, but this time I decided to take the train because um, taking the Acela fast train uh, is really convenient. You get a chance to sit down, they have Wi-Fi, and you can sit behind your computer and do all of the work and the administrative stuff that you have to do. Uh, you can walk around, it's not like an airplane, and uh, it's very convenient. So I actually uh, rode down to, to Washington, D.C. to meet up uh, with a colleague and a friend, uh, Dr. Uh, Piruzia, and I had a chance to visit his office and he kind of had a case that I want to show and, and share with you here. Dr. Zia, thank you so much for having me here. Thank you for being here. Dr. Zia had a recent case that he saw for a fo follow-up, and uh, he wants to share this with us. And uh, thank you again for sharing this. So let's get into the case and see what you have. Absolutely. This is a case that, that came in uh, last year. And if I may show it to you by uh, look. Actually, let me come over there with you, too. So come over. Um, we see this in endodontics all the time, Eddie. A patient was sent to me last year with tooth number three that had had a prior root canal. And radiographically, it was actually quite a complete fill with both MB1 and MB2s treated. But this lady had this tooth slated for an extraction. And the reason was her general dentist had seen that the radiolucency at the end of the tooth was not just apical, 
but it traced down the root. The J-shaped lesion type of a... Exactly, the classic J-shaped lesion. And not incorrectly had thought that high on the differential diagnostic list because of that type of radiolucency must be a fracture. Had referred the patient straight for an extraction. She came to us. When she did come to me, I noticed a few things. One, the tooth was not probing in the classic way that you would uh, expect a fractured tooth to probe, number one. Number two, I noticed that coronally, the tooth had not been filled. And as you know, coronal leakage is an important concept. It plays a real role in, uh, in cases not going well, and especially in the long term. When we look at the tooth, not just from the sagittal, but from the coronal, I saw that an MB2 does join MB1, but there was a hint that there is some anatomy there, and roots, as you well know, form around canals. And the radiolucency here suggested to me that here we may have a lesion of endodontic origin that has developed next to a portal of exit, as Schilder says so eloquently. So we decided before she has the tooth extracted, why don't we get back into the case? Why don't we look with the microscope to confirm the absence of a, um, of a fracture, which we did. And we went ahead, let me just bring this up so we can take a good look. We went ahead, we emptied the root canal system. We recleaned the root canal system, being very mindful of trying to get the, the fluid dynamics so that in the apex we're going to be able to get the lateral canal anatomy. And then we obturated the, the system with vertical compaction of warm gutta percha using BC sealer high flow, mm -hmm. which I find is perfect because of the, uh, of the fact that it's able to get into these canal intricacies really beautifully. And lo and behold, managed to get a lateral canal coming off of the MB2. And what I'm actually showing you now is a recall from last week, so this would make it about a 12-month recall. The bone, as you can see, has regenerated very nicely, both in the furcal lesion and the sinus floor has reestablished. So in, as an endodontist, this is what excites me. If a tooth has been slated for extraction, but we managed to offer the patient a much simpler alternative to maintain their own teeth, that's what I think we're about. Well, there's no question that you certainly saved this tooth from extraction, made uh, it a lot simpler for this patient to, uh, to keep this tooth for a much longer time because you managed to find the real ideology of the problem being an infection, intra-canal infection rather than extra canal infections such as a crack. What do you think the role of, how, first of all, how long was the root canal, the original root canal done? Original root canal was done in 2008. Mm -hmm. I saw the patient in 2020. Right. So there's a 12 year gap, if you can right. imagine, Ali, yeah. where the core had not been done. Actually, when I went in there, I still found cotton. Right. And that is, uh, that is so always that is an interesting that is a classic point. situation, you know, that the source of the problem, once again, was just the coronal leakage that uh, allowed the microbes to get back in and grow over time. It took quite a while. And so now what is your recommendation post-op? Should do you think, from what I'm seeing here, the crown, should it be replaced? Has it it's already been, it's fairly old, I would assume, because the original root canal was done through the crown? I would, think so, right? Or was it not? The original root canal wasn't done through the crown, except when the, when the, the core was never properly managed. Right. For the time being, and, and this is an interesting thing, during the healing phase of, of when we want to make sure that the case is going to heal before the patient invests further, let's say, in, 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 in a new crown, a great material to use is BC liner. In fact, nowadays, I'm filling up the access cavities. I aerobrate, clean. I fill up the access cavities with BC liner, blue or white, depending on, on the situation, whether it's an anterior tooth or posterior. And given the, the uh, compressional strength of the material and the fact that it bonds uh, amongst its other qualities, it's a good thing to use. That's, that, that's terrific. I mean, there's a number of lessons to be learned here. And I, as uh, you know yourself too, is I also have gone to the point of not placing any more cotton and cavity inside teeth to avoid problems such as this, where patients end up 
getting out of pain and they forget about the follow-up and the restoration and they go on and they come back with a reinfection. So that's really a, a great idea. So how would you summarize all of the lessons? Because this is such an educational case from several levels. What would you summarize down the, uh, the, the lessons to be learned from cases like this that are... The bumper stickers, the take homes if, if, right. if you like you are go. A, corona leakage matters, B, not every radiolucency that is, uh, goes along the side of the root is necessarily a fracture. Please remember, lesions of endodontic origin occur next to portals of exit, and before we condemn teeth to be extracted, let's make sure that the internal biofilm has all been addressed, that the case has been cleaned completely to allow the body to heal. So let's go in there, take a look with the microscope, and, and get it done. And also, I think uh, the obturation matters. Both the technique that, that you're using in order to be able to, to get lateral anatomy, and then the materials matter. Yeah. No question about it. I mean, you want to have something that's biocompatible and it's also antimicrobial at the same time to get to the stuff that you couldn't get to to begin with. Um, this is really a wonderful case. Thank you so much for sharing it with our audience. You have a beautiful facility here at Chevy Chase Endo. And how can people get in touch with you if they uh, have questions? Do you have any social media handles you want to share? Uh, Zia Endo. Uh, they can uh, take a look at, at some of uh, my cases on, on Instagram. And obviously, the website... Uh, yeah ccendo.net is a, is a good way to get Perfect. a hold of us. Because you're awesome endodontist here in Chevy Chase Endo in Washington, D.C. Thank you so much for your time. <laughs>